Uh, so the next portion is the uh, the lightning talks, and I'll pass it over to uh, to Sandra, who will uh, who will be operating the uh, the system. Uh, we have a couple of people on virtual, uh, so uh, if you can be ready on the virtual side. Uh, so all the lightning talks are about five minutes. Um, so we have a timer up here to to sort of let you know when when your time is starting to expire. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Xiang Yu Zhang. I'm here to represent the Purdue team. So our team consists of two professors, and then we also have two postdocs and 20 PhD students. We have uh, uh, expertise related to, to this program. For example, we have done a lot of work on program analysis, including source code, binary code, and ML analysis. We also done a lot of work in uh, deep learning, in software engineering, and software security, uh, and also uh, deep learning security. So we have done a number of uh, government projects. For example, we are currently a performer in IAPA CHOJI. So we also do, uh, for example, bind analysis in the DAPA V spells, and then forensic analysis in DAPA transparent computing and DAPA VET, which is a uh, bind executable program. So we also done a, a bunch of ONR uh, projects uh, in bind analysis. So our expertise in the binary ML analysis includes uh, a few aspects. For example, we have developed a number of uh, disassembly technique, focusing on disassemble of code as strip binaries. And then we also work on uh, decompile uh, binary code, reverse engineering binary, for example, we derive uh, type information, variable name information, symbol information from uh, strip binaries. So we also have uh, the ones uh, binary analysis engine, for example, BDA is one of our engine developed uh, for the ONR, uh, which allow us to uh, analyze uh, after interpret a, a binary program to derive information like dependence. We have technique that allow us to penetrate obfuscated uh, uh, malware for them to expose their malicious and hidden behaviors. So most of these projects have been, uh, uh, had gone through a technology transfer uh, for the agency uh, partners. So we also have done uh, work in code language model. Basically, we use large language model and transform model for to to train and analyze uh, source code, binary code, and also uh, natural language artifacts such as documents, specifications. So we use these models uh, in different applications. For example, we use them to detect and fix uh, secure vulnerabilities. And we also look into issues, for example, accuracy, fairness and variation of these language models. We have a number of data set that uh, can help this program. For example, we have uh, the Google Code Gem data set in which we collected 293,000 programs for 29,000 authors. So we have both the source code and binary. Uh, and then we also collected a, a GitHub data set in which we have mainly the C program that on GitHub have more than 10 stars. So we have both the source code and binaries. Uh, in this data set, we have about 106 uh, programs for 2,600 authors. We also have an, a, a malware data set with labels, uh, basically annotated with uh, the, the APT groups and the malware authors. That consists about 7,000 malware for 147 authors. We have a number of tools that uh, for us to, to collect data uh, from different sources. For example, we have a tool that allow us to, to crawl the GitHub projects and automatic compile into binaries. So we use a virus total and virus share for, for our malware samples. We use our own tool set, for example, disassembler um, for both ARM and XD6 to decompile programs, decompile binaries. We have our own feature collection tool like BDA, uh, PMP. These are the set of tools we developed in the, in the past decades. We have to, to clean up the data because a lot of these data sets consist of uh, substantial data leakage problem. For example, uh, a lot of uh, the projects have shared uh, libraries. If you simply just train those, uh, uh, change, uh, chain the model with those data sets, you could have a substantial data leakage problem. We have some tool for us to, to, to clean this data. And uh, in particular, we also develop a number of uh, uh, techniques uh, uh, for this program. For example, we have a a paper in this year, ISTA, which tried to reduce the bias introduced by uh, uh, compilers when you train a large language model for binary similarity. For example, in this case, we have two binaries. We feed it to a, a, a transformer model to determine whether these two binaries are similar. So we observe that, for example, this uh, one instruction on top, which is the uh, 
END BDR BR64 instruction introduced by the compiler actually caused the, the model to mispredict. We actually have a technique to reduce such a, a bias. So in this year FSC, we have another uh, technique, which uh, is a binary interpretation technique, which interpret two programs without uh, the setup of the, the, the environment. And then that also allows us to determine whether two programs are similar or not. So we are able to achieve a state of our uh, uh, accuracy. For example, we are able to get to 96% PR at one min stat accuracy at the, when you pick the top one. That actually uh, outperformed the, the state of R. And then for us, our main idea would be just uh, to explore the interplay between the advanced program analysis, co language model, and novel embedding and per training methods. So we have actually tested our, our, our technique on the data set we mentioned before, and then uh, we have a performance that actually better than the existing work that's uh, uh, NDSS paper in 2018. Um, that's all. Thank you for your time. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, uh, I just graduated from Columbia. I'm a PhD uh, graduate and an incoming faculty at University of Chicago. And uh, for this talk, I'm not going to talk about some of the capabilities of my team because I have not formed a team, but I'm mostly focusing on uh, discussing my past research work on how I build robust uh, large language models for different binary analysis tasks including detecting binary code similarity. So I will, since you're all experts, so I will quickly go through some background. Uh, so we all know that uh, software is taking over every aspect of our daily lives. And uh, in the meantime, it is also becoming uh, uh, more easy to attack due to this increased attack landscapes. Uh, it has been reported that even the critical infrastructure we depend on uh, is being attacked and vulnerable. And the program analysis is actually a, a key technique towards building trustworthy software. Uh, but it also requires uh, ex human experts to spend a lot of, lot of effort to tune uh, the correct program representations, the appropriate representations, as well as the analysis rules for various program uh, uh, various program artifacts, like a different forms of binary programs or different applications, security application, which have application specific requirements. And of course, recently uh, machine learning, the advancement has shown some promises, but uh, uh, like um, for example, ChatGPT or GPT-4 has shown some impressive performance for many security related program analysis tasks, like uh, detecting vulnerabilities or analyzing malware even with some natural language explanations. But uh, uh, probably you all know like machine learning, just uh, code models, just like any machine learning models, is also has been shown lacking robustness and generalizability. For example, this very well-known code summarization tool called to vac uh, where by just changing the variable name from array to t-types, it changes its correct prediction from sort to contains. So this kind, kind of observation, like some adversarial examples, demonstrate that existing code models are actually not robust and generalizable because they do not learn the actual program semantics or behaviors in order to reason about their behavior in order to pre make predictions. So if you, if you look at how the existing common practice of developing large language models for code, even including those Code llama like a recent state of the art, they still treat the program as some form of static text, like a natural language. However, the key problem here is that like a program is not like natural language, and you can uh, the semantics of the program usually manifest in its behavior in its execution. It needs to be executed. So, the the outcome of learning large language models only on the static text of the program results in the model to often overfit to the spurious uh, shallow textual keywords and cannot generalize to new programs uh, when such syntactic patterns are no longer exist. So that's why it explains um, why the existing most successful application of large language models are all mostly on natural language related tasks like code summarization, but uh, the program analysis task in the context of security applications often require more rigorous understanding of program semantics, such as tracking information flows. 
So the key idea of our approach is to emulate what human developers make sense of a piece of program, where we often study learning a program by writing the code and observe how it behaves. And during this process, we learn approximately uh, some knowledge about program so that we can perform this static analysis in our head, where by just looking at, at the static code, after we have been pre -tra uh, trained a, a little bit, we can imagine their approximate execution effect without doing very expensive dynamic analysis. So we kind of, what we did is, we pre-trained the large language model by exposing both the static code along with its execution and uh, so that the model can learn approximately how programs should behave. And once the model has been pre-trained, which is an expensive one-time cost on this dynamic analysis augmented training data set, we can fine tune the model and transfer this knowledge for various useful downstream program analysis tasks without doing dynamic analysis. And uh, turned out that uh, the model trained this way shows improved robustness and can detect real world uh, one day vulnerabilities since the learning embeddings of the, pro, uh, of the model is like a high dimensional embedding vectors, we're able to search in the large scale firmware images using this approximate nearness neighbor algorithm so that it searches more than uh, 1 million number of functions taking only a few seconds. So in summary, I have built this uh, augmented or contextualized uh, large language models to imp with improved rob robustness for various program analysis tasks on source and binary analysis, including detecting by uh, code similarity. Uh, and we're working on building large language models with robustness guarantee by construction um, in, as our future work. Yeah, thanks so for your time. Afternoon, everyone. Um, we're excited to be here. My name is Michael Lay. I am here to represent the IBM research team. Um, my colleagues here, some of them are listed. Um, others are working on the project, but not listed here. Um, some of them on WebEx. Um, so here I'm going to talk to you guys about a project we've been working on that has some shares very similar and parallel goals to the call for proposal today. Um, the project is called Code Genome. Um, and in essence, this project is focusing on um, building a uh, semantic fingerprinting of software. And the, there's two main aspects of the project. The first aspect is um, building a code gene um, and using that code gene to embed into a knowledge graph in order to be able to reason about um, software applications, um, reason about its similarities, um, uh, how to relate one packages and functions and, soft and files inside a package, how to relate to each other, how to identify um, attribution and th that kind of um, information. So to build up a code gene, um, you can see from the uh, left figures here, this is sort of a describe a sort of high level overview of the workflow. Um, we can take um, programs that are written in source code as well as, the, uh, as well as binaries and lift it into an intermediate rep representation. And from there, we can uh, have transformation that can canonicalize uh, that piece of software in order to um, uh, reach a, um, a version that we create as a bit code and then apply a, a sort of a fuzzy hashing to create an embedded space and a vectorized space um, and create an embedding for that. And that's essentially a, a gene that we then embed into a knowledge graph. Um, that's the, the second aspect of the work. Um, this knowledge graph comprises of uh, packages of software because um, software by itself don't usually, um, or they're not distribute, distributed by themselves, but usually inside a package that contain possibly other kind of archives. And those archives will be expanded to be files and lots of other <clears throat> type of meta information that we can reuse. Um, so within that file, you have lots of functions or maybe statements inside a program. And, and inside those, we embed these kind of genes into that. So that with that information, you can effectively go and start reasoning, asking questions about the relationship of um, your software. Um, so it's covering the screen a little bit here, but um, we, we right now we're able, we've sort of built the system out and we're able to support um, different type of architecture, x86, ARM, um, multiple compilers like GCC and Clang, um, multiple levels of optimizations um, so that when some source of code are being compiled for different environments, we take that into account because things are canonicalized. Um, so that, you know, representation of software semantically from one machine, move it to another machine, even though they're operating in different environments, um, they will have the exact same semantic and characteristic, which we'll then be able to pinpoint. 
Um, we also can handle obfuscation, obviously, because you know, we're not looking at the syntactical levels and lexical levels, but actual um, meaning and semantic of the software. So just some example use cases that you know, we've uh, toyed about and kind of uh, have demonstration on. Um, one of those things is um, this thing called semantic search. This idea is that you have um, given the same source code that are compiled across different environments, you know, have a different compiler, different architecture, maybe an x86 on ARM. Um, the idea is to be able to uh, uh, scan for those files and have the, those two files in a different environment actually share the same match because using hashing and things like that won't work on this kind of thing, right? Because they have different binaries and different uh, uh, syntactical information. Um, the other uh, thing, uh, use case that we uh, have shown off is uh, this notion of code evolution. And here, the idea is to examine, change, examine the changes between different evolution of the program. So even though you know, some source code has written one version as you move to another version, that might have some slightly differences in code, um, then you'll be able to use this knowledge graph to sort of understand how things evolved and be able to kind of either move forward or move backward and your understanding to analyze your software. Um, the last aspect that you want to point out is this notion of attribution in forensics, which kind of parallels a lot of the things that are being talked about in this call for proposal. Um, given the, the genome, the knowledge graph that we can build, um, given an unknown piece of software that you haven't already ingested and understand, the idea is then to um, analyze this the software package and be able to identify commonalities between the things that in this unknown package that you've seen and the things that you ingested, right? So by able to do that comparison, you're able to identify software packages and um, functionality that you've seen before and be able to attribute them to this new piece of code that you've never seen before. All right. so. That's kind of a quick recap of uh, the, the technology we talked about or that, uh, that encapsulate the code genome. We, in, in case you're interested, we have a, at the bottom here, there's a YouTube link to a demo that we've done. Um, and also in the previous slide, there's some links to um, talks that have been given at the Open Source Summit and, and some other venues. So happy to talk about more of that offline with any of you. All right, thank you. So hello, everyone. My name is uh, Shi Qing Ma. I'm assistant professor uh, at UMass Amherst, uh, I joined uh, in the summer. And uh, uh, first, uh, some background about our institution. So uh, UMass, is, uh, UMass Amherst is a top-ranked uh, computer science program. We have uh, many centers, including the Cybersecurity Center. And the focus of our cyber institution is uh, forensics analysis. We do have other related centers, like uh, uh, data analysis, data and information, information retrieval, et cetera. Uh, we do have, uh, for the cyber institution, we do have uh, uh, a bunch of uh, professional developers and also a lot of uh, researchers uh, who, can, who you can work with. And uh, of course, graduate students and uh, faculties like me. And uh, we do have uh, real world experiences, uh, real world cases, especially network forensics. Uh, and uh, we, do have a large uh, facility infrastructure. It says uh, Massachusetts Green High Performance Computing Center, which is uh, the home of uh, many top 500 high performance uh, computers. And uh, uh, UMass also have a share of them. We do have a bunch of uh, DGX uh, A100 uh, machines. Uh, uh, and uh, as a faculty there, I do have access and I do have uh, my own computing facilities. And we do have award-winning supporting teams from CSCF. And uh, what do I do? So I do software security. I do program analysis, uh, including source code and uh, banner analysis. Uh, I do forensics analysis, which is a focus of my research. I do APT detections, including using binary and uh, source code to, to perform activity clustering and analysis. Uh, I do AI safety, uh, especially focusing on building trustworthy AI models, especially deep neural networks. Uh, for example, using AI to analyze uh, forensics uh, information uh, for clustering for uh, attribution. And uh, I do software engineering, like uh, code clone detection, uh, debugging, and uh, also uh, a lot, uh, a bit of uh, text analysis to use the natural language analysis techniques. And then related to the source code, uh, we do have uh, uh, a bunch of expertise. Uh, I did the program analysis, uh, including code clone detection and uh, user attribution from uh, 
the code itself and from uh, metadata, uh, like package information, the whole tool chain, not only the code itself. Uh, I did a, a style analysis, uh, user attribution for documentation and uh, code as well. And uh, we, we, have, uh, we have been trained to use large language model for different security tasks using AI for cyber security uh, tasks. And uh, uh, lastly, we do have uh, our public data and also preliminary data, including millions of uh, binaries and uh, Linux uh, packets and uh, a bunch of uh, Windows malware. We do have, uh, using the techniques uh, we developed earlier, we do can improve many of them, including over 50% accuracy uh, increment. And uh, that's uh, basically that's it. And uh, my name is Shi Qing Ma. My email is just the first name, last name at uh, umass.edu. And uh, uh, look forward to collaborate with you. Thank you. All, all right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Andrew Andela. And you may have seen Crambit AI in that list. And you may have looked us up and been like, OK, what is this software supply chain company here talking about attribution? What is going on? Um, so it actually comes back a little bit to what Chris was talking about, how he wants to move things from dynamic analysis into static analysis. And what we actually do in the software supply chain world is make sure that the software you're about to run will work and behave as intended. So we actually do automated reverse engineering to pull up behaviors statically. So obviously that's pretty important when you're trying to attribute things because you want to understand what are the behaviors of binaries and understand who could do those things. Um, but why do we know how to do this? What have we done in the past? So I'm a, a two-time DARPA PI on multiple programs. Um, most recently, my co-founder and I at Karambit AI worked on two different DARPA programs, one called Enhanced Attribution, so attribution of attackers, um, and one was called the Cyber Hunting at Scale. And in both of those, we did the binary to binary malware analysis piece where we needed to detect if this new piece of malware is malware or not. And we took that expertise and those lessons learned and pulled it into trying to solve the problem of the solar winds attack. And that's a lot of, well, what is the software going to do before you run it? Because attackers, um, as you may know, are really good at evading antivirus. They're really good at getting around any kind of defenses people are going to bring. Now, why does this matter for attribution? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the pyramid of pain. If anyone's seen this before, um, this is actually a pyramid of pain for attackers. So if you are detecting them on the things at the bottom, like hash values, they literally don't care. You can take a, a piece of malware, change its hash. It's going to do the same thing. If you're just detecting on that, yeah, no one cares. But things at the top of this, the tools and the TTPs, that sucks. If you have to change those things, you need to change humans. You need to change their training. You need to have a human go and rebuild something, right? You have to write new pieces of malware. So what we do from an attribution perspective and at Crambit AI is as we build what we call a software build behaviors. So we can extract behaviors from binaries again without actually executing them. And then we can link those behaviors between different samples. And this really will help enhance ease of attribution and detection. And why does this matter? Well, here's an example. This is actually some screenshots I grabbed from our website. If you want to go to Crambit AI, you can actually try us out. Um, but we basically are able to say, hey, what kind of things does a threat actor need to do? Um, well, they probably want to do some sort of rootkit behavior. So we pulled up some rules that we can find. Oh, they're, they're doing a mini filter driver. So they're trying to hide files on a host. Uh, what else are they doing? Oh, they're going to encode data using XOR. So that's obfuscation. They're trying to avoid getting detected. Um, and then this thing at the bottom is persistence. So they want to persist because once they start running, they want, to be, they want to be there forever, right? And we're able to take those kinds of aggregations of TTPs and find, oh, what other files have we seen? Have we already processed that have these TTPs? And that's really useful when you're trying to figure this out. Um, this does right now only work with binaries, but the features we're actually extracting, uh, we could also extract from source code. Um, but mostly we've been focused on binaries because that's where attackers live. When they're actually running something on your system, it's going to be compiled. But why is this hard? Um, and honestly, it's also why cybersecurity is fun. 
because cybersecurity is inherently a conflict against other humans. Um, I don't want to say it's a game because there's real things in the mix here, but it's a challenge and they're, they're constantly going to change. And what's amazing is there is no action you could possibly do on a computer that is inherently malicious. Adversaries are going to constantly change their TTPs depending on the target, depending on what they're trying to do. Um, the example for no, no TTP is inherently malicious. Uh, on, the, on the left is WannaCry, right? Ransomware. And on the right is Microsoft's BitLocker. They're doing the same exact thing. They're encrypting your hard drive. If you accidentally do the one on the left, you're in trouble. If you don't do the one on your right, you're in trouble. So this is why context is incredibly important. And we have analytics on top of all of our data to be able to figure out, okay, is this expected or not for particular types of software? And, and we aggregate that to ease when you're linking between different kinds of malware. Um, what's also interesting is because malware is inherently, and cybersecurity in general, is inherently about this offensive defensive mindset Evasion is part of the game. Attackers will try to evade. Um, and this is an, an example of the 3CX attack that happened a few months ago. And we're able to actually detect in the malicious version of 3CX, the allocation of read, write, execute memory and the encryption of data. So we were able to detect, oh, hey, there's an encrypted payload because the attackers had to hide. And we can use obfuscation and evasion as indicators of ATTPs, TTPs for a particular kind of attacker. Oh, time? Okay. Uh, so try us out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Thomas Wall, and I'm here to uh, represent uh, Grammatech, um, which is a, a cybersecurity company uh, with a, a very long history of work uh, in this field. Uh, we're physically uh, located in Ithaca, New York, but uh, the people at Grammatech are kind of all over the place. So I'm from this uh, area, for example. Um, and um, yeah, I would say the um, the one thing that sort of stands out about Grammatech is that we have this um, very robust tool set in the space of uh, cybersecurity uh, developed over the many years um, in um, program analysis, uh, program transformation, both at the binary and the uh, source code level. And I'll give you a few more details about this. Um, yeah, so our uh, focus is definitely on security, but we also have work on maybe fringe areas of, of security, such as increasing product uh, uh, developer productivity and basically not having to, to uh, chase bugs all the time. And we typically have a large number of projects uh, in this uh, space going on, many of them with uh, uh, DOD uh, departments. Um, yeah, if I uh, had to name one keyword uh, uh, that describes the expertise uh, of Grammatech, then it would probably be uh, a program analysis. And as I mentioned, this covers both uh, binary and source. I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, so uh, we have done uh, a lot of work in uh, extracting features from binaries and source uh, over the years already. Uh, one particular target was to uh, be able to uh, classify uh, malware versus uh, benignware. Uh, and uh, from this sort of large toolkit of uh, features that we can extract, uh, I've shown some some examples here on the slide. Um, and uh, the point is that in a new domain, such as uh, this domain of this uh, source code program, where we need new features to be extracted, um, we are in the position to to build techniques to extract such features fairly quickly uh, from uh, binaries and source, uh, because we have this uh, very rich and and robust. Um, set of techniques uh, to our disposal. Um, and yeah, maybe a few more words about uh, the binary and then the source code space. Um, so um, as I mentioned, we have uh, used uh, a feature extraction from binaries, among other things, for classifying uh, malware against uh, benignware, uh, but also for code comparisons uh, based on semantic criteria, um, such as, for example, um, shapes of the control flow graph of a, of a program um, and this has been used in, in uh, lots of uh, applications, not only analysis applications, but also rewriting, etc. Uh, perhaps that's less relevant for, for this particular program. Um, and then we basically have a similar sort of suite of capabilities at the uh, source code side. 
Um, so, uh, first of all, at the front end, this covers um, a fairly rich set of uh, languages, which we can, first of all, parse, we can analyze them, we convert them into an intermediate representation, uh, and then we can apply transformations to the source code, um, either uh, semantics preserving ones or uh, those that change the semantics of the code. Uh, again, some examples here, and then perhaps also uh, cross-language translation, which is maybe less relevant for, for this program. Um, and one thing I wanted to add to the binary case in the previous slide is that, again, because we have been dealing this in this space for a long time, uh, we are very flexible regarding ISAs, operating systems, platforms, etc. cetera. Um, that, that's also one thing that I think we're uh, very strong at. Um, right, so this was a little bit about uh, us. Uh, what we are uh, seeking in, in terms of uh, partnerships here is, um, so basically things related uh, closely to cyber forensics is not something we have, we have done. For example, uh, authorship attribution, of course, that's the one key thing for, for this program. Um, uh, threat intelligence, uh, and then also slightly more broadly, statistical analysis to uh, design, set up, run uh, experiments on maybe large code bases, um, et cetera. Uh, we're sort of interested in priming, but of course this um, this is very tentative at this point. This depends on what what exact setup uh, turns out to be best for a, a possible team. Um, here is the the set of capabilities sort of uh, assigned to the to to the list that you can find on the um, uh, source code programs uh, website, um, and sort of divided into what we are um, considering ourselves experts in and what kind of expertise we're still seeking. So you can sort of find your, your, your place here. Um, and I think that pretty much covers it. This is just a, a summary of, again, what we can do in terms of the problem statement of the um, source code program and, and everything that's not on that slide. That's basically what we're looking for assistance. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Um Good afternoon. Um, my name is Alexi Nogin. I'm a head of research at uh, Red Balloon Security. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thanks. So Red Balloon um, is a small business headquartered in New York City. Uh, we have been around for a little more than 10 years, and our um, entire focus is on cybersecurity, particularly for embedded devices. Um, and uh, we have a number of commercial products, and we're very active in research and government services. We've done work funded by DHS, DARPA, Air Force, Army, Navy, and uh, we're looking forward to hopefully adding IARPA to this list. Um, I'll, and let's go to the next slide. So we've done a lot of work in uh, reverse engineering and analyzing a number of these devices, uh, finding uh, vulnerabilities. So we know firsthand a lot of sort of the attack vectors and the attack techniques that are used. Um, and so th this slide shows a sample of some of the things we have discovered. And let's let's go to the next slide. So the most relevant capability that we have for uh, for this effort is the uh, ability to analyze binaries in including sort of complex um, um, complex firmware binaries for embedded systems so we can um, um, we can unpack complex binary format we we can analyze formats we can do it you know we can automate the binary analysis um, in a robust um, repeatable way so that for example you can use um, one disassembler backhand on uh, one CPU architecture, another disassembler backhand on a different CPU architecture, swap one for another uh, without having to re-implement your automation. So we provide this, uh, so that our OFRAC um, source is um, available on GitHub. Um, so it's a flexible framework that allows you to use, um, basically allows you to automate a lot of the uh, binary analysis and modification workflows. Um, and on this program, we are uh, looking to be a subcontractor, again, focusing obviously on the binary analysis uh, part of the work. And uh, 
So if you're interested in teaming up, uh, please reach out. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and it, uh, so please reach out at research at redbillingsecurity.com and looking forward to uh, talking to some of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next up is gonna be Dan Thompson, Seth. Yep, let's see if you can hear me. Oh, we can, can hear you. you. All, right. All right, all right. It wouldn't be a video seminar unless something went wrong. All right, and I just have the one slide. Uh, so SIFT is a small research firm. We specialize in artificial intelligence. We've been around 23 years, mainly focused. Uh, most of our staff is in Minneapolis, but we have people spread around the com uh, country. Uh, we have obviously done a, a team with a bunch of people, some of the people on this call, and we've actually had uh, most of the aspects of the government as customers in the past. The two things I want to talk about mainly that we do uh, we are part of the cyber grand challenge and so using our AI capabilities, we made a very large cyber reasoning system, which was, uh, you know, basically integrated a bunch of existing tools, but then we had artificial intelligence agents running them, trying out things, reporting the results, changing their behavior, changing settings, using heuristics and AI to reason about it and then trying again. Right? And so we were reasoning about how much effort to put into, uh, uh, you know, how, how much effort do we try to find a bug and how much effort then do we spend to uh, fix the bug? Right? And so you're, you're making constantly making decisions like that. So we think that kind of cyber reasoning system might be something very useful for doing large scale analysis of a bunch of binaries. Um, that gray image that you're seeing in the bottom is, isn't very interesting, but what's going on there, we have uh, 20 different AI agents analyzing different aspects. They're reporting. The top agent is uh, doing sort of the quarterback and is now an analyzing stuff. And so we can monitor their state and we can see, oh, this one's stuck. This one is uh, thinks it's found something and then they can share that information with other folks as well. Um, we also were part of a NIST program to classify bugs, which again, it should be a great a tool for extracting features for a learning system like this. That uh, tree there is just some of the, uh, uh, the, the reasoning we did uh, to pull out uh, the bug feature. So we do a lot more symbolic analysis than uh, LLM, obviously, though we've done a bunch of LLM. So we should be able to help out, I think, a lot on explainability. So if somebody has a hole in, for explainability on their team, I think we might be a good uh, fit there. The other key piece that we have that I think would be really interesting that I don't think anyone has covered so far is we do a lot of uh, cultural computation, uh, starting with uh, analysis of etiquette and text. And so we basically have cross-cultural models for etiquette, and then we can extract from uh, interchanges uh, we could infer relationships, power relationships between people. We were able to look at, uh, say, military chat and say who outranked who. That's one of our, our key results there. And of course, etiquette is not going to be a huge uh, con contributing factor to the to this program. But the idea to extract cultural features and then uh, reason about them and, and and train on them might be a great way to get a different set of features that we could pull and start making some classifications on for this program. Uh, we're also we've been doing uh, other stuff, text based analysis on this a lot of, but we've been like looking at forums from around the world and trying to identify people trying to influence other people to join radical groups, uh, that kind of stuff. So, uh, I want to just say we've got that cultural piece there. Uh, we're also part of the DARPA civil sanctuary program where we're trying to inject uh, change behavior, trying to make uh, online forums a lot more uh, friendly. And that that's also cross cultural as well. So, yeah, that's the nickel tour of SIFT and what we bring. Obviously, we're looking to partner. So, if you are interested, my name is Dan Thompson. My address is down there at the bottom, and then SIFT.net uh, is our website. You can find out a lot more information there as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christopher Taylor. I'm from Tactical Computing Labs, and today I'm doing a presentation about uh, capabilities brief, basically for our source code. Well, an effort we'd like to participate in the source code effort. Um, we're a research and development firm. Um, our firm focuses on scientific computing and risk five hardware and software design. Um, everybody in our company has a background in supercomputing and high performance computing. We do work on compilers, runtime systems. We do hardware simulation, design, testing, evaluation, implementation of hardware. Our company um, about a year ago. We got a, the first radiation hardened risk five chip into space through a um, SPR program with NASA. Um, in terms of scientific and numerical computing, 
We've got some experience and people in our company with a background in machine learning and AI. Um, our company is headquarters is based in North Texas. We've got an in-house data center facility with multiple CONUS locations. We provide commercial support for the structural simulation toolkit, also known as SST from Sandia National Labs. And we've recently provided Risk Five support for Bliss, HPX, OpenShmem, NVIDIA, UCX, and LibFabric. Um, our company aligns with the source code effort um, because we have a in-house capability called SIVA, the compiler um, integrated right. vulnerability analyzer. SIVA is extensible to multiple programming languages and SIVA is extensible to handle binary compiled application code. Um, SIVA currently detects software vulnerabilities. You can tell it from the name, right? SIVA can be extended to other applications and other purposes. It's a machine learning based capability. It currently targets uh, C application software. It's extensible to other languages, right? So we're not just beholden to the C language. It was originally developed under the DARPA Cyber Fast Track, which was going back in time about the 2020, what, 2012 timeline. So uh, the next couple of slides, I'm gonna show you all um, some performance metrics, statistical performance metrics of SIVA. Uh, we're gonna talk about stack-based buffer overflows, heap-based buffer overflows, integer overflows, wraparound errors, divide by zero errors, free memory on the heap errors. And I think I really wanna emphasize here, these are 10 full cross-validation um, measurements, right? So we've done 10 experiments. In each experiment, we've got a set of programs we've broken up into three partitions, training partition, testing partition, and evaluation partition. In the testing partition, we actually subsample randomly um, data set from uh, data set from there to actually train our model. That means we're holding out training data and the next time we do a fold, some of that held out data ends up in either the testing, evaluation, or training set. All right. So this is our accuracy for our, our software, um, our capability, excuse me. Uh, accuracy is in a, in a very broad stroke is sort of your ability to hit a target if you're on an archery range. This is our precision. Our precision represents our shot group, which is how tight um, the arrows when they hit the target are with respect to these different uh, vulnerability categories. This is our statistical recall. So if you think about the machine learning model as an index to a search engine and you were provided a piece of source code as a query, right? This is the ability of the system to come back and say, yeah, this looks similar to this type of vulnerability. Our F score measure, uh, one of the things I wanna highlight here and apologize to everyone in the room, I had a copy paste error, which is why there was that little bump there to 90%. So um, that was an error on my part. <clears throat> That's a harmonic mean, right? So we're taking a precision recall rate, multiplying together and dividing by the sum. <laughs> this is our rock curve. The di orange diagonal line represents random, so coin toss performance. So the bottom axis, our x-axis represents our false positive rate, and our y-axis represents our true positive rate. Obviously, you want a greater true positive rate than a false positive rate, and the higher your true positive rate is, the more you're performing better than random. And of course, on the other end of the coin, the worst you're performing than random. So SIVA, um, the performance, the reason why I wanted to show this to y'all today, this really represents SIVA's ability to characterize software, right? And in this particular situation, we've characterized the software with the distinct intent to find vulnerabilities in software, right? Um, we can extend the aperture on this capability to a variety of different problems. Um, problems that you find in compilers, problems associated with the source code program. Um, Someone in this room has got a data science, statistics, mathematics background is probably gonna say, well, aren't y'all just overfitting? And I wanna remind you all, this was a 10 fold cross validation process. Every fold we do randomized sampling. And then of course in the training set, we do subsampling to eventually provide information. Uh, just to be sure that we're not over biasing of the data set in one way or the other. So uh, the SIVA itself aligns the source code effort because it's a novel characterization technology. It performs a forensic task. It's re it can be repurposed to detect coding styles. It can be extended to support binary machine code and other programming languages. And SIVA can be extended to perform similarity detection from known samples, and it can accelerate attack attribution for both public and private sector responses. Thank you very, thank you very much for your time. I wanna thank ARPA for providing the forum. And again, sorry for the rough, Start there. Uh, appreciate your patience. So, hello. I am uh, from a group of researchers at Technical University, and we closely collaborate 
with a company called uh, Gen Digital, which was created by merge of Norton Lifelock and Avast. And what I would like to offer you is a library or our expertise on classification of something which we call hierarchical multiple instance learning data. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So our motivation why we started to be interested in this type of data was really from the uh, from the security industry because we worked a lot with engineers and they just love to store data in JSON or in other structured data uh, data formats and they are really hard to let's say deal in, or let's say be ingested by machine learning tools because they are variable. So if we can go to the slide six, <coughs> next, 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 that one. No, <coughs> sorry, can we go two slides back? Okay. Is this that? Yeah, that, that one is perfect. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for my slide deck. Uh, so this, this shows you the challenge that this data represents because there can be a lot of missing features so all these four samples come, come from the same data set and you can see that these data uh, can be very variable. They can be very small, they can he have missing items and they can be enormous, right? And you, you want to have a machine learning model that is able to sort of digest and deal with this heterogeneity. So uh, we developed a special tool that uh, we call JSON Grinder, and it resembles a little bit the graph neural networks, but it has certain uh, good theoretical properties. So I will probably not go through my slide deck because it was kind of long, but I will explain it on, on, this, on this slide. So we construct a neural network that is with a structure that resembles these JSONs. And since we know that these samples are three, we can prove some theoretical guarantees. And by the theoretical guarantees, we have extended the universal approximation theorem to the space of all JSONs. So if the JSONs are statistically distinguishable, or the classes within the, the JSONs are statistically distinguishable, we can separate them. And we have sort of a, of a, of a proof. And we deployed this uh, in, uh, in two companies. We deployed this uh, in Cisco and we deployed this in Avast. In both cases, we have been, we have been detecting malware. We use it to detect uh, malware from disassembled binaries or from static analysis or from dynamic analysis. And in both cases, we have deployed the classifiers into production. So this is sort of proven technology. We also compared the tooling for, on some publicly available data set. And with a little bit of tuning, you can typically reach state of the art accuracy. And this is sort of what I want to offer. This is my expertise, but and also I have worked a lot with people from the security. I am not expert at disassembly and in parsing, parsing abstract syntax tree, but I think that our expertise can be useful because abstract, abstract syntax trees, as the name suggests, are trees, right? And we are very good in that. The last advantage that I didn't mention is that we do not really touch the data. We take them as they are provided to our tooling, which is really nice for explainability, right? Because we can usually pinpoint the individual keys which are triggering the detection, which is very good for increasing the trust in our solution. So if there, are, there is some group who is, thanks, who is looking for expertise in machine learning, we would like to team up. Thank you very much for attention.